instead of, you know, why did you turn left? Where were you going? I mean, we were being watched too. So I thought to myself, wow, you know, um, you know, probably people keep track and they kind of know what's going on in their tiny little town. And, and so hiding would be pretty hard. Um, and then he took us to a, to a convent and I, I did, I put in a picture, if you go to the next one of, um, just a communion set as scene. Can I ask you, can I ask you, well, go ahead. I was gonna, is that snow on the rafter in the, in the barn? Was there snow on the rafter? Um, yeah. when like we, snow, sure. It was winter when we went to Poland, as you'll see in the next picture. I purposely wanted us to go in winter because my character, uh, Rosha, has to make it through uh, winters in the woods, and I wanted to know what that would be like. Um, but when we went to a convent, you know, we were this this picture is is a picture of a communion and um, with a, a Jewish child, and I don't know which one, but I one is hidden among them. I um, this picture actually is, is taken from a something we found in the Poland Museum, and um, and just sort of the efforts people were going through to kind of blend in and i sort of work with that a lot in my novel too about the hair and you know trying to match and and be um you know sort of fitting in and never mentioning anything in yiddish etc but um you know one thing that was so helpful as a writer to go to this convent i went to was that i went in and i the minute we walked in there was this like waft of mushroom soup. <laughs> and um, then you could hear like, you know, how your feet moved along the, the floor and all these kind of sensory details that kind of, um, I don't know, enriched everything, you know, yeah. to, as as you know, you work with your imagination as much as you can in, in your in your study, and then, you know, going out in the world sometimes can really bolster and, and, um, and add so and this is just a picture of of the this sort of very dense forest it was a forest where partisans had camped it, it might look like any forest we know too but it was very hard to navigate through really really thick and dense and the idea of digging burrows to stay warm at night or or hiding in the hollow of a tree i mean um which is how people survived in the woods or in bear you know they dug 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 down and um i did try you know digging down and i as i said i so i had my eldest daughter and she was so when we got to this point, she was like, why can't you have a novel set in Greece? Why are, why are we in the winter in Poland? I mean, you know, so I have to probably try to do something like that so she can come on a research trip that's really pleasant. Um, but it was frigid here. And um, yeah, anyway, you can though, thank you for showing those photos just to give a little sense of it. But um, anyway, the research was so meaningful and and it was you know I worked with like a mushroom forager and I worked with a forest tracker about how someone could move through without leaving tracks and and then you know mostly my research actually had to do with um violin and a master class violinist that was not part of the travels although I did get to go to Tel Aviv and meet this guy Amnon Weinstein who has been re he's been he's been rebuilding violins that have come to him now that he has this project you know from holocaust days and i went oh. to his studio and i saw these violins that he you know has salvaged and then rebuilt and they're being played all around the world in these in called violence from violins of hope and he showed me you know these star backed violins these old you know that they're not really made this way anymore and um and one that he wouldn't rebuild because there were ashes inside it and he just set it to the side and um oh. yeah there's some of the uh, questions that that my students asked, and you know, I wanted to ask also. I mean, you you touched on this before how important music is in the in the novel. Um, this girl who has to remain silent yet she's a musical prodigy. So, um, yeah, let me, let me talk about that a little bit more about about why uh, a violin. Yeah, I have a, a feeling it connected to what you just said, and and. <laughs> How, how you did that, I mean, it, because I, it, it's stunning the way you describe music, you know, how, how people feel about making it and how they make it and how and, the, and your emotional reaction, people's emotional reactions to music and get the, you know, getting that in words. Uh, Thanks. I, I really, I really, you know, the, the last time I've read anything in prose or fiction that, that ev could really evoke music that much was uh, James Baldwin's Sonny's Blues. Um, she has a wonderful past, but there's there's so much in your novel that does that. So, yeah, maybe maybe talk about that. That Thank the you. importance yeah. of music in a novel and and why violins and yeah. You know. 
Thanks. Yeah. Um, I mean, first of all, it's it's interesting. You know, I, I think I so I mentioned how I felt unheard in many ways as a child. And um, but my father, my father played violin every day of my life. So he was this very um, devoted, not necessarily prodigious, prodigious but <laughs> um, devoted violinist. And I ended I studied voice and sang. And so sometimes we would be making you know, music together. And it was one of these times, especially whenever I would sing that my mom really stopped and actually listened. It was this, I think for me that there was this visceral truth about the connective power of music. It was kind of the one arena in my life where I felt very connected in, um, and it was kind of in contrast to a lot of times of not feeling connected. So to me, there's this connective tissue that, you know, music can be between a mother and child or a father and child or, you know, two people in any way, but, um, or maybe all the listeners in a room, you know, it, um, it can kind of really can be a connecting thing. And so I think music, I saw music as that. And I also saw that if this child had to be silent and she, um, you know, wanted to stay connected. To me, the music between her and her mother was almost the way if you're afar from someone else and there are stars, you both look up in the sky and see it at the same time. It's like, you know, they're there kind of. Oh, yeah. um, and um, the other thing is that when I learned about my great, great aunts who had tied strings from their wrist to their babies at night, to me, this is like these strings in the night this way of staying connected through darkness. And that's one reason I chose violin because I felt like this it was this stringed instrument that was kind of able to connect. And so Shira like opens the window a little bit whenever she practices plays, no matter where she is hoping that this sound will like reverberate through the air and maybe somehow, somehow reach her mom. And um, yeah, so I think it was like that. <laughs> that was That was really why I was moved to use it. And then, in addition to this incredibly generous master class violinist who talked to me and read the manuscript several times, you know, about how a prodigy would learn and what she would play and when she would practice and how it would work that she would learn this piece and then that piece. I mean, there was so much about that. I had no idea. And um, but I also worked with a musicologist who kind of we sat and listened and he helped me hear stories in the music. You know, how do you hear stories sort of beneath the music? Because you know, when you're untrained, you're like, that's beautiful. You know, <laughs> that's as far as I could get, you know, um, but then sort of hearing themes and hearing story. And it was it was fascinating, you know, so I, I think I also steeped in music and I was listening all the time and listening to different pieces and trying to see what they evoked. So. That comes that comes out so powerfully. And there's there's a point in the novel where um, Sophia, she becomes called at that point, and we could talk a little bit about the way her name has to change from stage to stage, um, where she she feels free to be herself, you know, the, to not not hide the music and for the music music to come out. Uh, may, maybe um, maybe you could read some portion of a novel that that that, that deals with music and um, yeah, share that with us. Okay, let me see. I um, it's not just me telling people how wonderful this is. <laughs> there was a time when I had notated in this draft, in this um, reading copy, where she played. There was a piece she played that I'd love to read if I can ever find it. Um, but I no have pressure. to think of where it is. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, it's when she, hang on. Maybe I'll I'll flip around in this at a, at a little bit later and try to find it because I'm not sure I'll find it right away. Okay. Um, but yeah, when she's playing, she's playing. Ravel's Kaddish somewhere in here. Ravel's Kaddish somewhere in here, and I, I can't find it. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, here's this one little part, you know. There's this little part where she's, you know, practicing um, Bloxnigun, and 
it, see what what happened to me is when I would hear the music after being steeped both in the music and in the story of this child, you know, is that the music would start bringing up like the thematic um, stuff. Yeah, so, very much. so right here, very much. You know, I'm just just having flipped through and finding it, and I know your students remarked like there's a real lot of music in here, <laughs> so I just found it here. But um, so. She practices Bloch's Nigun, which Pan Shirpak taught her, was the second of the three-part Balshem, composed in memory of Bloch's mother. She thinks of her own mother, wishing to be hopeful, yet the music's every note is infused with a haunting melancholy. Zosha re still remembers home, her family, that particular moment on Friday nights before everyone took their seats at the dinner table, lighted candles flickering in their eyes. There would be a hush, and then they'd settle and each would tell stories of their week at the bakery and university in the workshop. As the war drew closer, the stories changed, grew darker, unasked questions sat on their lips and worry lodged in the lines of their faces. Still, they played their music afterward, folk songs, gypsy dances, the insistence of hope, escalating to a fever pitch, ending in meditation. Zosha thinks she can hear those same songs alive inside the nigun, until it plunges into discordance and darkness. The moan of chords, the bow pressed upon two strings at once, then the sound narrowing to a single note as the music slows and slips into echoes and finally cries out, a solitary wail repeating higher and softer until it trails off, no longer heard. Zosha lingers, bow on string even after the sound stops. Flecks of white rosin drift and float into the surrounding air, She's expected in the chapel soon. Still, she extends her packing ritual, loosening her bow and restowing the sponge and pad, laying the violin in the case, lowering its lid and snapping it shut. For an extra beat, she stands motionless and listens. In the ringing silence, she pulls the window closed and scurries out of the chamber through the corridor into the bruised night. Beautiful. That's that, and as you say, I mean, it's so resonant with the themes of the of the book, and just beautifully expressed in it in itself. Um, God, <laughs> that yeah, congratulations! I mean, that's <laughs> you're so sweet. Thank you. And then you know, I think that one of the things that's interesting is like I ended up giving her this bird so that someone could sing. You know, in the silence, you know, <laughs> like that. You, that you, that you, somehow you had, you you anticipate one of our, our questions, of course. Oh, yeah, so, yeah. Um, before we go into that, I, I, I want to point out also, I mean, there's even a little detail like the flecks of white rosin in the air, you know, with everything else. I mean, and I'm, I'm sure that's from your experience of listening and, and looking. I mean, it, it puts readers into the scene, you know, sensually. You're there, you're experiencing it. And you know, even, even a little thing like that is, is such a great detail to put in. Um, well, let, let's, let's talk more about our, our yellow bird. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah. It becomes like a, a kind of avatar for Shira. And okay, well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, she had her mom in the barn and she had this little shred of blanket, but I wanted her to have. A, some something that could express the music inside mm -hmm. her but also i had so our daughters one of my my eldest daughter had these imaginary friends and um and i had also uh which was always really an interesting thing honestly a little sometimes scary and once i don't know if you ever read the new yorker where adam gopnik's daughter has this imaginary friend named Mr. Ravioli who is always too busy to play. She always wants to play, but Mr. Ravioli's like, I can't, I have to run to some meeting or whatever. Um, but anyway, it's like <laughs> the idea of these imaginary friends was on my mind. And, and then I had also heard of a child who in a trauma had cupped her hands um, and kind of just like walked around. I think the idea of wanting to have something you care for, you control when you're so vulnerable and yeah. um, kind of just in this, in this uh, spot that Shira was in. So all of these kind of multi-determining factors, I think kind of moved me into the idea of, of giving her this little bird. And, and I was really um, intent on you not knowing for sure if it was a real or imaginary bird, at least at first, because for a child mm -hmm. 
imagining it is real. Like they feel it's real. They believe in their, in their, in their friend, you know? Friend. And, um, yes. and so I, you know, that was one of the things, you know, sometimes people ask me, you know, why is it a yellow bird? And I say, well, again, like most of the decisions are so multi-determined. I mean, I'm sure I was thinking of the yellow stars and I was thinking of stars in the sky that connect you. And I was thinking of, um, you know, how yellow tulips mean f friendship or, you know, there were like all these different things that, that I was thinking about. But um, I also thought to myself, you know, I want people to believe it's possible that this bird got in the barn and that she's actually with, you know, has this bird. So, but, so it can't be a purple bird, you know, <laughs> I'm not in Poland anyway, you know, like, like it was kind of that I didn't want it to be like this brown bird, you know, whatever. So I, there are so many different factors. I, I feel like sometimes, you know, especially when we read literature and we come up with our theory about like why it's this way or that, and you think of one explanation, which can hold thematically. But I also think that often our minds are such webs and that there are many yeah. things pressing in at once yeah, yeah, and that yeah. it isn't really one thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that um, it, it segues into there's a number of questions my, my students were asking also. Um, one being, well, take you take that scene. I mean, a lot of the book is written from um, from Shira's point of view. From the point of view of a, of a five-year-old and a six-year-old, seven-year-old, eight-year-old, as she, as she is in the novel. So the um, question was, how, what was your process in getting into that and tell it? I know sometimes you, you know, you kind of stand above and explain what, what's going on and other times you're, you're in her mind. Um, yeah. And then another student asked, well, what if, what if this had been a teenage girl instead of a, you know, instead yeah. of a, a five-year-old, but, uh, but yeah, could you speak yeah. a bit about that process? And, yeah, uh, it's a good creating question. Creating that point of view, yeah. Yeah, I thought a lot about the age of the child for this reason, because you once you're in that point of view, you're limited by access and understanding and um, all kinds of things. Everywhere, and, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and in fact, I think one thing I should just, returning to the bird for a second, is that that bird turned out to be, as a writer, a really helpful tool because I could put subtext in. So if the, so, you know, Shira may not understand how displaced she feels, but the bird hops from the nest of her hands into this other thing in the barn, sort of angrily feeling, you know, or, or like something can happen subtextually that will bring, convey an emotion that a, a five-year-old would never be able to articulate. And so that, that I found really helpful um, as things went on. And then, you know, the bird started morphing into other things, you know, gray and with talons um, as things became treacherous. But you know, if I wanted, I mean, one thing that I did here was, you know, I Shira doesn't really understand that Jews are being hunted exactly, you know. Um, yeah. I wanted it to be vague, like that her mother was trying to keep her, you know, sort of somewhat protected in consciousness, but also saying enough that she'd be silent. Um, I was, I was interested in, um, like what it is when a child actually may not really know their parents' names, like mama and tata, you know, and then they get separated and they realize, God, I never figured out, you know, their actual names and now what? And um, maybe even could forget her given name, after, you know, um, especially when the shred of blanket is eventually buried and, you know, et cetera. So I kind of was interested in that because, well, for many reasons, I mean, I'm trying to let me find this little document. I, it's not a document. It's like this little thing. I was at the I was at the Holocaust Museum in um, DC at one point where there was this program called Remember Me, and that's like a literal question. Like, do you remember me? And if you do, you could tell me what village I'm from and what my name is, and I could find my family. And um, you know, the idea that your identity can be so sort of top. Topical, <laughs> like it's linked to just the name you were given, and you That's might lose the entire thread of your family. Um, was so striking to me, um, especially because we try to figure out what does you know make for personal identity and what kind of keeps us the same over time. I mean, often it's memory. We sort of sometimes think, or John Locke thought anyway. But you know, you 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 um you know you think that if you know if I'm the same person over time, I and mean, things will change. You know. <laughs> Etc. But but I remember when this and I remember that and those things connect me to that. Um, and what happens when it's like too fragile and you forget and especially with something like this where 
you know, at the time you might, when the war ended, it wasn't like it is now where, you know, there could be regist really sort of good registries or you could, you know, for now, now, if you want to find anyone, you can just probably find them on Facebook or, or LinkedIn or, <laughs> or something. And, and back then it's like, you got off at a train station, there'd be like some fence with like a thousand names, like pasted on, you know, pieces of paper fluttering in the wind. Um, and um, it was just like, you could be lost. You could be t completely lost and have no bearings and no way to get back. And, it, you know, I just thought that was so profound, like what war did um, sort of in so many different ways, but in this small way, like where one would just literally like unravel their sense of, of self, you know? I, could, I mean, I could see that happening still with the kids who were separated from their families at the borders. I agree. I going, going through that, that kind of trauma also. Um, you, when you mentioned that Shira, um, she's, she's, she's not aware directly that they're being hunted because, you know, somebody hates me because of who I am. Why, why would that be? And then that gets reinforced in the convent when, uh, when she listens to a priest give his homily about how, how the Jews were responsible for killing Christ and should be persecuted. And, and so she has to start thinking of herself as, as a, um, as a bad person. You know, I mean, what, what does that do to a, a child's identity if they're being continually told that um, they shouldn't exist? You know, there's something wrong, yeah. there's something wrong about their very, very existence. And, yes. And then I was interested too, in how, you know, there were people I interviewed who they got their sense of religious identity was, you know, also completely turned upside down because, you know, when they went into a convent and finally felt safe for, for that time, or were holding yeah. on to the statue of Mary, like, you know, their, their hands, like on the folds of the stone, you know, where that was their soothing place or, um, you know, finding another way to kind of be grounded and then being told after actually, <laughs> um, you were a Jewish child, I hid it in the coven. Now you're like just the the kind of flipping around that happened to children in terms of these these matters, um, which are really formative. Mm -hmm. You know, but the the way you dealt with those characters of well, I, I'll, I'll put it like this: um, I know that um, one of the ways the novel really resonated with me because of my own um, family's background, particularly my mother, who came, who, you know, was Jewish in a small town in Poland that went through much of what you described in the novel. Uh, when you when you described the way uh, the Jews in, in uh, Rosa's hometown uh, have to dig ditches with their later machine gun into them. That's exactly what happened in my mother's town to uh, you know, the 2000 Jews that, that lived there, including, including 25 members of my, my own family. That, that person had said so that resonated in that situation, as in your novel, you have um, you have Poles who helped, who tried to hide Jews, etc. You have you have others um, who hunted them, who were rewarded for their death, etc. And and you often have that dichotomy within the same character, like you know, your your farmer Henrik is. You know, on one hand, he's risking his life and his family's life to hide this Jewish mother and her daughter. On the other hand, he's taking the price of, of raping her basically every night that, that she's in the barn. And I mean, maybe talk a little, I mean, I, I think it's one of the things that makes your novel so, one of the many things that makes it so powerful and realistic is that um, you talk very, you, you write very well about human flaws, human virtue, you, but also, you know, also human flaws. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I was I was very committed to the complexity of of our humanity. You know, that a person might do this very heroic thing and at the same time extract payment, or um, you know, yeah. So he's bringing socks and potatoes. He's also visiting her in the barn at night. Their relationship morphs in different ways. It's it's blurry. You know, I I thought it it, it had to be blurry. Um, I want I I um. You know, there are you know it's it can be really distressing to read that kind of stuff. You know that that there would be this farmer extracting this price every night in the barn. Um, but I also felt it was really important to tell that story because I feel like sex was 
used in this way very much during the war. And I, I wanted to say that that particular thread came from having interviewed a, a, a woman who as a child was with her mother and was visited by this farmer. And I wanted to read this poem she wrote because, um, you know, it's, it's so interesting to me. Right. So this woman, Myra, again, wrote this poem called Wild Strawberries. Oh. Sometimes under cover of darkness, Mr. Rakshi would visit. I would see my mother's silhouette, her long hair down her back, and in the dark, the outline of Mr. Rakshi's powerful shoulders as he sat opposite her on the straw-covered attic floor. He would talk in hushed tones. I sat beside my mother, but apart from them, feeling a vague excitement mingled with fear. He would bring sweet, wild strawberries in the night. Wow. And she said, you know, I don't know if they were in love. I don't know um what you know i don't think it began as love but um you know i think it, it evolved over time and this what was so interesting about her was she also talked to me about her father who had been he had disappeared very early before they ended up leaving and going into this into this farmer's barn and when i think she was near 80 when we were talking and she said to me you know, we never saw my father's body. Like he, you know, he disappeared and we don't know. And so she said, so there may still be a chance, you know, that he's living, you know, there may, he may not have been killed. He, there may still be a chance. And I'm, I'm there like trying to do the math thinking, I mean, yeah, yeah. there may, but that's how the mind was like, you know, it, it wasn't like boundaried really by, by reason when you had such huge losses to contend with. Um, you know, so so it was just so interesting, all the things. And I and I thought a lot about her situation with that, like staying up, having to be a part, but also kind of feeling the energy and um, and what it must have been like. And well, you're, that that complex humanity that you're getting across, it's also I mean, Rosa starts um, responding. Exactly. Second, at, at, at one at one point to Henrik. And that I mean, that's an uncomfortable scene to read. Um, yeah. And I mean, have you gotten any any kind of negative feedback about about that depiction? I I, I don't have it because I think it is part of that complex humanity you're trying to you know get across. Yeah, I mean, I I I um a Polish editor actually had written in saying that you know she she didn't like it that Rosha's body responds, and you know, and the thing is that when you study sexual assault. I mean, it's one of those big things, you know, I mean, bodies do respond and sometimes they respond even stronger when there's aggression involved. And then it's the person is left trying to understand what that response meant when, you know, it is a it's a bodily response, but it doesn't mean, you know, necessarily, that it, you know, but it's so hard to separate. And I think it, it it's so painful to think about um, yeah. that kind of connection. And, um, you know, I think that generally, you know, with regard to the complexity of the characters, I mean, it was really important to me that, you know, this mother, you know, was risking so much and loved her child so much. And then there would be this moment when she just wishes for a flash, her child would be out of the barn or yeah. that, yeah. that she could eat for a second, all the roots and not save yeah. whatever, you know, or this child who loved her mother dearly, but wished for one second, like, what would it be at a different place? Or, you know, what would it be like, maybe it'd be better, you know, and then the the wife of the farmer who's clearly quite righteous, but then holding back the eggs from the mother because there's this suspicion and upset. But then on the other hand, maybe she's a little relieved that Henrik's visiting the other woman in the like there. I wanted it to be like that, like like it was upsetting. But then also maybe there was this weird relief in it or, you know, each of them, this nun is mean, but then she turns out to be quite scared. And this girl is also a total jerk. But then it, you learn that her parents are actually alive in the town and she's here in this convent orphanage. And, you know, so like I just I think that those things happened all the time. And um, the children and all the people were processing with you know, with just all this complex reaction. And, um, and that that's, real. that's what the human condition is, I think. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's what makes it real. That's what makes us believe the characters, you know, as, as if they're people, because they are, they're, they're described as people with all those flaws. You know, every, I think every parent has that has that moment where 
the baby's crying and crying and crying all night. And, you know, I'm not going to throw out the window. <laughs> like, child, you know, but, yeah, but that's the only reason. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Have, have you, um, you know, speaking of that, have you, I know it was, the novel was published in Polish in Poland also, right? Yeah. Or it has, yeah, it has. So has there been any, uh, I, I'm thinking, you know, in, in 2017, the Poles enacted this law that basically made it uh, criminalized uh, blaming Poles in any way for anything that happened to Jews during the Holocaust, to simplify it. And they, they backed off a bit. I mean, they, they took away the imprisonment part of that and just made it a, a, a fine. Um, so you do have the, the complex humanity, you know, Poles doing both good and bad things in the novel. Was there any, any kind of um, reaction in Poland to that? You know, I was, was I was I was worried about it, and um, instead, I just kept receiving letters from readers in Poland that I got to translate on my computer, or or um, you know, d various <laughs> things about how meaningful the book was, and um, it maybe it is because there's this roundness that it kind of tempered because uh -huh. no one's a caricature, you know, no no, uh, or I hope not anyway. I intended that they not be, um, but but rather a human. And, and this is what it is. And so I didn't really get a backlash on it or a kind of negativity. I, I really was moved by reactions of many Polish readers. Um, That's good. Yeah. That's really good. That's good. Okay. Um, well, I think we should probably open up to see if we have any questions from the, uh, from the audience. And um, I don't know, this has been a great conversation. I could I could so go on much. talking the rest rest of the day with you about this. Um, but let, let, let's see if we have any other other questions. I, I do have let's see one one question before I get into Neil's that, that one of my students asked, which is um, he he noticed a lot, a lot of use of the of white. And I think this had to do with the bird cha changing colors and so on. And he wondered if there was any uh, symbolism in that in that for you. Yeah, what a what a astute question. Um, let me say two things about that. Mm -hmm. One is that, you know how, I mean, every, maybe every novel, but this novel went through a real lot of drafts, you know, <laughs> and, um, and not only that, but it, I, I have, I mean, 20 years I wrote out that are, that do not show up in this novel. Yeah. So, you know, from the time uh, the mom gets to New York all the way till, you know, they end up meeting again, there's like, it's all written out, but it's all cut out and it's not there because um, ultimately it seemed like the heart of the story was in the barn and it was, the, it was with this child who was still young and all these other reasons, but but I guess I wanted to say that, you know, there were times when, you know, I had Rosha in New York and she had a second child and she couldn't bond with her. I mean, you know, <laughs> there's like all this stuff happening that, you know, that's not in there now. And she also has like some mental sort of, it's it's so much anguish, so, so much anguish. And um, there's a time when um, she starts like seeing the bird feathers and bird bones and whatever in her mind and they're always white and then she's in a at, at a moment in um sort of a um psychiatric ward and the pills are white and the person's robe is white and the walls are white and the you know like every single thing there is white and um mm -hmm. While I think that in the final version of this novel, I think that there wasn't so much about that, but there was this idea of like the yellow fading or the, or the somehow it became to, it, it was something about like the loss and the kind of the, you know, kind of the deadening or the bleaching out. So there was like a kind of psychological move in my mind that was coming out with the loss and the distance and the longer they were apart and the more it kind of um, faded, you know, yeah. and that memories became like faded and you were struggling to remember and maybe you were imposing things on it or it became like a kaleidoscope rather than a, a like a clear vision and that kind of thing. So what a what a very uh, careful reader. Um, I yeah. really appreciate because, you know, I think in some sense that the white turned out to be almost like an artifact of a larger thing I was working on that didn't even show. But this reader, your student kind of picked up, which I think yeah. is yeah. very smart. I remember I remember the bird 
fading to white at one point in Shira's perception because of, as you say, that sense of loss. It sounds, yeah. Yeah. Good. Thank you. So, um, Neil, any any questions that uh, you can you can bring us? Yes, I. Um, thank you, Jennifer. First of all, what? Give me a second. I want to thank you uh, for the conversation, both you, you and Wayne. Um, before I get to the question, I want to uh, say that um, you know, teaching literature is is a tough gig, right? Um, but you just made it much easier um, <laughs> with, with this with, with this hour long conversation with Wayne, and and you know, I know because my students do respond, and I think. What you've done is you've humanized um, not only um, the story, the novel, and the complexity of the human condition, um, but you've you've also spoken about you know craft and how ideas can form into stories and 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 I think you know that's that's what our students want and and need is that that sense of, of, of humanization where we're doing a unit in my English lit class on dehumanization, which your novel speaks of as well. But, um, but I think when, when you can bring literature to, to, to people the way you, you two just did, um, all I can do is, is, is just bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let me, uh, here's the question. Um, uh, Cynthia Oz Ozick, said of her short novella and short story, The Shawl, that she was moved to give voice to the silenced, particularly to the women and the children who suffered during the Holocaust. Aside from the hiding you speak of, is this giving voice part of the novel's pulse? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I, it is. I mean, I think that's in a way where the music also comes in, which is like our voice in various different ways. Um, it's, it, you know, it, you know, um, it can come in in so many different ways. And one thing I wanted to say about that is that, you know, this mom is telling a story every night to her child. Um, and and um, there are all these different ways that like creativity saves a person, you know, that that the, like the recognition of beauty can save a person, you know. Like as I would be, I would be like talking to a hidden child, and you know, she would say like, "I I didn't think I could go on," and then I I got like the scent, this vanilla scent of tree bark, and I I breathed it in, and then I kept going. <laughs> and um, you know, the the way in which um, this woman and child, anyway, in my story, are kind of are are following <laughs> Ozik in this way. I mean, it might be that. Like we see how creativity and beauty are such a key to human survival. And um, and Shira's music is this way she's sending out into the world, this kind of you know deep emotional complexity of her own into the world, but also this neat longing and need for connection. And um, you know, all of that stuff is embedded in it. And I don't know why I feel like I should tack on this one thing I want to say, but I guess it's because I think about this for people who, you know, for all of us who are always learning about writing, <laughs> like for me, it's a lifelong learning. And in fact, I, um, you know, I was, I read, um, I, I put up, I put up Wayne's book, Rumor and Stones here because um, it, it's, it's like a book I'm learning from. It has so much incredible writing in it. And, um, but but I was thinking to myself, like, you know, I would be describing and it took, you know, years of this little girl in this hay bale, you know, like seeing the middle distance and then <laughs> closer in and farther and the, the stream of her pee and all these different things. And I realized that I was given sort of a, um, you know, a, a sideways gift when our daughters were born deaf because I started hearing all the things that I that they couldn't. And I mean, I didn't, you know, I used to maybe block out half the stuff I heard, but the fact that my kids couldn't hear it, there was so much grieving in that, that I was starting to be conscious of everything, like exactly how that river moved through the trickle of st stones or how the leaves would move in the wind. And I mean, like all these little sounds that they wouldn't even with hearing technology access. And um, it, it kind of made me a listener 
in a way that I really wasn't, I think. And that has made such a difference for me because I can sort of sit with the sensory like world, you know, in a way that I, I don't know, I think sometimes our life experiences just kind of accrue to give us access in a way that maybe at one life stage we don't have and then at a later life stage we do have. Um, and some of that is, is, you know, time and random chance, I guess. But um, it's, it's kind of meant a lot to me as a writer. Um, it sort of opened a world. I had a, um, an idea that the college should offer a listening 101 class um, just because it's such a rare thing. Um, and, you know, I don't know if, like you said, it just takes time or experience to start to listen and start to actually hear what's going on around you, even, even what somebody's saying to you. Um, but I think, um, you know, there's a, there's a, a little bit of a lack of that right now. So thank you for reminding us of the importance of listening. <laughs> and thank, thank you, you, Jennifer, so much. Um, Wayne, did you have any last comments or questions? No, I, I um, love what you just said, Neil. It's, it's uh, and I think the idea that it, it comes from um, becoming aware of what a loss it is not to be able to do that and to try to make that connection you know, by, by, by listening. And, and I, hope, um, I, I hope a lot of people read and listen to your novel. Thank in, you. In, uh, in, in all the ways that they should. And yeah, thank, thank you so much for, for being with us today. Thank you. It's an honor for me. And I, I'm so glad we were able to have this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks. Thank you. It was great. <laughs>